All right, good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Doug Jenkins. I'm with the Finlay Hancock County Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank you for joining us uh, on the Zoom webinar today. And also, uh, this will be the first time that we've done a webinar on Facebook Live. So just a couple of housekeeping measures before we get into today's program. Uh, I believe as uh, an attendee, your microphones are automatically muted. Um, we'll also have our, uh, our, our presenters mute their microphones when they're not presenting. That way we don't have the the uh, speaker jump around and, and uh, get some feedback, that type of thing. If you do have questions, uh, we will take those throughout the webinar and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end of it. Um, you can put those questions in the chat window. If you scroll down to the bottom of your screen uh, right now in Zoom, you'll see uh, the chat window. Uh, you can go ahead and send messages there. If you're having problems, any uh, audio problems right now, please put something in the chat menu too, or in the chat window too. That way we can uh, take care of that. I uh, do want to let you know that uh, we are uh, recording the webinar. It will be available uh, on the Finley Hancock County Chamber of Commerce YouTube page uh, probably a little bit later today. Also will be posted on the RCO Law website. That's rcolaw.com. Uh, that'll be on their main page and also their COVID-19 page. Now from RCO today, we have Matt Klein, Bill Beach, Amy Luck, and Kathy Rohde all joining us. I'm going to turn it over to Matt here in just a second. Um, but just uh, first, a, a little preamble from us uh, at the Chamber of Commerce. Um, this is vitally important to us. This is the mission of what we do. Uh, if you've been watching the videos that we've been doing here over the past couple of weeks, you've probably noticed my background has changed a little bit. Uh, and what I eventually ended up settling on is I have these old hand-painted signs in my Grandpa Smith's business. Uh, he used to do uh, property valuation and real estate uh, down in Lima. And I really like these signs, uh, but it kind of hit me yesterday. This is what we're fighting for right now. This is a legacy that we're trying to pass down to our grandkids so that they one day maybe have some signs to hang up in their makeshift office. God hope, God willing, they're not doing it in the middle of a pandemic. But this is what we're fighting for. So you can pass that dream down and keep that dream going. And uh, we're really happy to have your support. We're really happy that... Uh, um, you're using the tools that we're putting out there. We're going to continue to do things like this uh, as we go through this so that you have the, the best information available and uh, can keep your business going. Now, with that said, I want to turn it over to Matt Klein. He'll give us some of the details about what we're going to be going over today, and, and we'll get into our presentation. All right. Hey, thanks, Doug. Very well said. You're absolutely right. Uh, this is what we're fighting for. We're living through some really unprecedented times right now, and as a result, there's been some unprecedented legislation to try to overcome some of the challenges we face, particularly those challenges facing small business. Uh, so with us today, I have a couple of my uh, fellow attorneys out of RCO's Toledo office who specialize in the areas of employment uh, and HR law who's going to be able to, uh, they're going to be able to answer some of your questions and help work through some of these challenges and hurdles that you face. Uh, in light of this COVID-19 pandemic. So Doug, I also want to take a quick moment to thank you and everyone at the Finley Chamber for all you're doing for small business and making this valuable forum available for everyone today. Uh, so it's going to be my pleasure to introduce to you first my partner, Bill Beach. Now, some of you may be familiar with Bill. He does present to a lot of organizations here in the Finley area. That's because Bill is a Finley native. He still retains many strong ties to our community. Uh, he's been with RCO Law now for over 30 years. He focuses his practice primarily on employment law and civil litigation. He works with clients from Fortune 500 companies all the way down to local small and mid-sized businesses. He does work with nonprofits as well. He's really one of the state's best and most experienced labor attorneys. He excels at working with the clients to provide pragmatic advice and solutions to problems. He's a problem solver. Also with us today, we've got Amy Luck. Amy, uh, she has a ton of expertise in employment law, civil litigation, municipal law, and family law. Her labor and employment work uh, includes revising employee handbooks, analyzing structural changes, conducting internal audits, serves as outside counsel, and provides legal support to human resource departments on a range of issues. 
that small businesses face. She's a real asset to our practice. We're lucky she comes to us after practicing in Kansas City for 10 years. She's an Iowa native, so she's a Hawkeye amongst all the Buckeyes here in Northwestern Ohio. So I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, my two partners, Bill Beach and Amy Luck, and they're gonna help you work through some of the issues you're facing in light of this pandemic. Thanks for being part of this today. Well, thank you, Matt. Again, everyone, my name is Bill Beach, and we are working remotely. And since we are doing that, you'll hear me say next slide or backslide because the PowerPoint is being controlled out of the Findlay Chamber offices, and I am not in the Findlay Chamber offices, the power of technology. So what I intend to do is in the first half of our presentation, to walk you into a very muddy maze of laws and regulations and try to lay a foundation for you to understand what is going on to the extent that anybody can understand it. And when I am done, Amy is going to walk you out of that maze onto a clear sidewalk that will make for easy travel. She'll be answering some specific questions. So if you have questions as the program goes forward, Please send those via chat and we'll try to answer them all at the end. Obviously, there's way too much material and law to cover in an hour. So we're going to try to hit the high points and get everybody educated and at least help you recognize some issues. So Emily, with that, if you can move us to the next slide, please. Okay, we're gonna start with the federal laws and the timeline. Obviously, there has been much more that has happened other than these three laws, but this is the critical start. Uh, on March 6th, the Coronavirus Preparedness Response and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act was passed, and that really isn't anything that's going to impact employers directly. So we are not gonna focus on that during today's presentation, but I wanted to put it in the materials so that you would have an understanding of where we've been, where this really started, and I think we're gonna add some more laws to this list. We just haven't done that yet, or Washington, D.C. has it. So the real start of matters that impact employers came on March 18th, when the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, also known as the FFCRA, was passed into law. And that had a significant impact on employers. And in the law itself, it stated that it would be effective within, or not later than 15 days after it passed. So since it passed on March 18th, everybody assumed that it was going to be effective on April 2nd. Well, the regulations came out before that, and in fact, the Department of Labor said that it is effective April 1. So if anybody still thinks that that was effective April 2, it's not, it is April 1. So within 10 days after the Families First Coronavirus Response Act was passed, then came the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act also known as the CARES Act. And this is where the big money really comes into play relative to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. There is a lot of money at issue in the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. However, the money is addressed more specifically in the CARES Act. And just for brevity, I will refer to it just as the CARES Act going forward. And the only other thing I wanna point out on this slide is notice that the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which I will refer to as the FFCRA going forward, has a sunset date. The other two do not. Their dates and their different sections are effective and conclude at different times. But with the FFCRA, there is a definitive sunset as of today of December 31, 2020. Now, if this crisis were to continue or relapse at some point between now and then, I think we could expect that that act could be extended well beyond December 31. But for now, at the end of this year, that act uh, will sunset. So, Emily, let's move on to the next slide. 
All right, the items on the prior slide were the main federal orders, now, or the federal laws. Now in Ohio, we haven't had any legislation passed yet, but what we are getting are executive orders and director's orders. Now, if, the, if you look at the fourth item down, you can see that so far, or at least as of earlier this morning, that Governor DeWine has signed 13 executive orders addressing the COVID crisis. The first one was the first item on this list on March 9th, declaring a state of emergency, and that certainly impacted employers. The second one uh, made emergency changes in childcare rules because so many employers were closing down and schools were closing down that childcare was a, a very important focus for the governor. And then the third, executive order was March 16th, where Governor DeWine lifted uh, certain restrictions on unemployment restrictions. Now, I'm not going to go into the 10 other executive orders because they're not really as relevant to employment, but these are important. And then the probably the most important is not an order from Gover or Governor DeWine, but rather from the director of the Ohio Department of Health, and that is the March 20th stay-at-home order. Now that order is somewhat controversial, and if you watch the news, you'll see that there is controversy in almost every state regarding their stay-at-home orders. So just understand that the executive orders are from Governor DeWine, and we will have links to these materials on our website and at the end of this PowerPoint presentation. And note that the March 20th, order was from the director of the Ohio Department of Health. So there is a little bit of difference there, but the impact on us employers throughout the state is the same. We all are obligated to follow these. So we have gone through the first slide with the main federal laws to date. This slide addresses the critical Ohio orders. Again, not laws, but orders. And Emily will move forward to the next slide. Now, what's a good government crisis without a lot of acronyms? And I know one of the frustrating things about being on your end, being an employer trying to figure out what is going on, is in part dealing with the acronyms. So I wanted just to put this into our materials so that you would have a resource to go to uh, in case you weren't sure of some of the acronyms that are being used on the news, in the media, by your counsel, by your accountant, or by somebody at the chamber. Uh, we, we get used to talking about these things and we often talk in acronyms. And sometimes if you're not dealing with them on a daily basis, you don't understand the acronyms. So I'll just go through these very briefly. The CARES is just the CARES Act that we talked about on the second slide. The CDC is a federal agency, and they are very involved with what's going on, and it impacts employers. The CISA, you might think, what, what in the world does cybersecurity and infrastructure security have to do with the COVID crisis? Well, they put out an order deeming certain uh, cyber businesses to be essential employers, and they did that before March 20th when the Ohio Director of Health put out her order. So the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, their order is attached to the state order, which was the stay at home. And that helps define essential businesses. So if you have questions about essential businesses and whether you are an essential business, I would encourage you to get on the internet or go through our website and find the March 20th stay at home order because it lays out the essential businesses and attaches the federal information from the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Now, many of these other acronyms are more self-explanatory, so I'll skip down a few. Uh, e -E -E -I -D -L, Economic Injury Disaster Loan, that is an acronym that's frequently used now, and that is part of the CARES Act, which was part of phase three of the government's response. Uh, EPSLA is an Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, which is part of the FFCRA. So it's an act within an act. 
And the same goes for a couple items down. The FMLEA is the Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act, which is not a part of the Family and Medical Leave Act or law. Rather, it is a part of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So it can be a little bit confusing, but these are acronyms that you're going to hear through the day today and through our presentation, and certainly in the weeks and months to come. The other critical one on this page is the next to the bottom, the Paycheck Protection Program. That is the hottest item of everything that's going on right now, and that is also a law within a law because it is a part of the CARES Act. So if you have questions about acronyms, here's a good place to go start to try to figure out what you're looking at and what is meant by the acronym that you're seeing. So we can move forward with that, Emily. Okay, as the government has put out information, they're doing it in quote unquote phases. And just so everybody understands, phase one was the first law that we addressed on the second slide of this presentation. That's the CPRSAA. And it really doesn't affect em employers to a great degree, other than they spent $8.3 billion uh, to fund federal agencies to help with the response, which at the time seemed like a whole lot of money. It doesn't seem like a whole lot of money compared to what's happened since, but understand that that was phase one. And right now we have three phases completed and I am fully anticipating a phase four and potentially a phase five. So understand that is phase one. If you hear the phrase phase one, this is the law they're referring to, and it really does not impact employers directly. So Emily, let's move on to phase two. So phase two is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. This is where employers really get involved with the coronavirus response from the federal government. Now this is a very long act and it has a variety of divisions which are all individual laws. And this may be more information that you need, but just in case it ever comes up, within the FFCRA, the two divisions that apply directly to employers are Division C, and that is the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act, and Division E, the Emergency Paid Sick Leave. And those are also individual laws, like I said, within the FFCRA. So we're walking through the maze. I hope you're not getting lost yet, but you can always go back to the materials and walk through it at your own pace. So Emily, let's move on to phase three. I think we missed a page. No? Okay. Well, just phase three. I wanted to go to phase three, so we, we've missed a page in the uh, materials, but that's okay. I'll talk about the FMLEA, which is the Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act. Again, this is not a part of the Family and Medical Leave Act, but it does amend the Family and Medical Leave Act. And what this act does, it gives employees 12 weeks of job protective leave but what's interesting to note here is that the first 10 days of this can be unpaid. But the rest of it, if you qualify or have a qualifying employee, will be paid. Now, to be eligible, an employee simply has to be a full or part-time employee who's worked with you or the employer for 30 days. And the reasons for the leave, and just make this simple, remember the FM. LEA has 100% to do with children or the care of a son or daughter under 18 years of age if their school uh, place of care or their child care provider is unable to provide services due to a public health emergency. So just to simplify things, the FMLEA is solely to cover that circumstance where a son or daughter is unable to go to school or ch child care uh, because of the coronavirus. So if you're not someone or have an employee who does not have a child under the age of 18, this simply does not apply. 
and we can move on to the next slide, Emily, and we'll talk about the pay. If you have people in this category, after the first 10 days, which are unpaid under this part, uh, you as the employer are responsible to pay the employees not less than two thirds their regular rate of pay that they would be receiving if not for the coronavirus uh, crisis. Now, as an employer, the good news is that the amount of pay is capped. If the two thirds of the employee's pay is greater than $200 per day or $10,000 in the aggregate, those numbers are the cap. I put those in green because I know everybody likes to see green when we talk about money and it makes it a little easier. So the cap for the pay is $200 per day and $10,000. And if you add that up, you go beyond the first 10 days of the FMLEA, which are unpaid, and then that leaves you 10 weeks. So the $200 per day amounts to $1,000 a week for 10 weeks, and that's where you get the $10,000 aggregate cap. And again, the FMLEA and everything under the FFCRA apply only to employers with fewer than 500 employees. So to recap the FMLEA, just remember that has entirely to do with children under the age of 18 and their inability to go to school or to childcare. Don't make it any more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, if there are any more specifics that come up, uh, you can get into more details if necessary, but that is the basis for the FMLEA. It does expand the Family and Medical Leave Act and applies it to employers with fewer than 50 employees, but it doesn't change it for any other issue other than for the child care and school issue. So, Emily, if we can move on. All right, the EPSLA. This is the second individual law under the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act. And this law applies to employers who have fewer than 500 employees, again, just like the FMLEA, but this provides a different type of leave for different reasons. And the leave provided under the Employee Paid Sick Leave Act is for the first 80 hours of sick time that a full-time employer, or I'm sorry, a full-time employee would receive if they fall into a qualifying category. Now, as with a lot of things in the coronavirus response from the government, uh, there are a lot of gaping holes in their definitions because everything was done with significant haste. So full-time was not defined within the law. But if you go back to the acronym page, and I don't want to go back there, Emily, but if you go back to it on your own, you can look at the list and see that one of the acronyms is the Fair Labor Standards Act. And I put that on there because that is the law that defines full-time employees and what makes up a full-time employee. So it can become relevant for the employee paid sick leave. Now, for employees to qualify for this, uh, they, they simply have to be employed. There is no minimum length of time as there was with the Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act. There they had to work 30 days. Here, there is not that requirement. So we'll move forward, Emily, and we'll get to the money part of the EPS, or the reasons for leave, I'm sorry. Now, they, this slide, if there's any one slide, is probably the one you will refer to the most in the foundation portion of this presentation. Because under the EPSLA, you have six reasons that you can, or six methods to qualify for leave as an employee. And the first is you, being the employee, are subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order because of the coronavirus. The second one is if you've been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to the coronavirus. The third one, if you're experiencing symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis. 
Now for you employers, you're certainly thinking about an employee right now that is going to always be experiencing symptoms no matter COVID crisis or not. Uh, so they have to seek a medical diagnosis in order to qualify for this leave. Item four is where the employee has to care for an individual, and it doesn't have to be a child, they have to care for an individual who is subject to an order referenced in part one under the reasons for the leave, or they've been described as ordered to self-quarantine as addressed in part two. So that is the fourth reason somebody can qualify for this leave. The fifth reason, and this is where you will see the only crossover between the Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act and the Employee Paid Sick Leave Act, there is crossover on number five here. And this is where the employee has to care for a son or daughter under the age of 18 whose school is closed, their child care provider is unable to provide care, or their place of care for the child has closed because of the virus. So that is the one area that crosses over, and the benefits that are due to an employee are different under the two laws, but I'll, I'll discuss that in a moment. Finally, the sixth reason that an employee can take leave and get this pay under the EPSLA is a, a rather vague statement. The employee is experiencing any other substantially similar condition specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services in co consultation with the Secretary of Treasury and the Secretary of Labor. Well, I read this much like we do with the Americans with Disability Act. Any, in that act, there are the word reasonable was used. And what is reasonable to an employer is often very different than what the employee considers reasonable. And it has been nicknamed the Aid to Dependent Attorneys Act for that very reason, because it is set up so that there is a fight over the word reasonable. And I would anticipate that some plaintiff's lawyers are gonna take the substantially similar language in item number six and say, Yes, this is substantially similar to, or my client's situation is substantially similar to one of the items above, and the employers can say, no, that's not substantially similar. So that is unfortunately an area that is vague right now and that we really don't know where it's going to go. I just hope it doesn't go to litigation for any of you. Emily, we can move forward. Now, this looks more confusing than it really is, but under the EPSLA, there are two different methods for payment. If you are out for items one, two, or three, or you have an employee who is unable to work for those items, one, two, or three from the previous slide, they are do up to a maximum of $511 per day or $5,100 in total. And that is obviously a 10 day period, which is the pay period for the EPSLA. Now, if they're using their leave time because of items four, five, or six, the amount per day is capped at $200 or $2,000 in the aggregate. And again, because it is a 10 day leave period, you have the $200 times 10, that gives you the 2000. So that is the cap for the compensation that the employer will have to pay under this act. And it's a little bit different for items one, two, three, and items four, five, and six from the list of reasons that the employee can take leave. And again, this act applies to employers only those employers with 500 or fewer employees. So Emily, let's move on to the next slide. As I mentioned, there is a, an intersection between the FMLEA and the EPSLA. And that intersection is when an employee has a child under the age of 18 and the child is unable to go to school or their daycare provider is sick or their place of care is closed because of the COVID virus. 
both of these laws, which are within the FFCRA, cover that circumstance. And as an employer, you may find yourself having to pay an employee over a 12-week period because remember that the EPSLA covers the first 10 days or covers 10 days of leave and the FMLA, FMLEA covers 12 weeks, but it doesn't cover the first two weeks. So if somebody is off, an employee is off to care for a child, assuming the school is closed as it is across the state, they can get their first two weeks of pay under the EPSLA, and then the FMLEA will kick in and potentially give them up to 10 more weeks of pay at the rates we previously talked about. So the school issue, the daycare issue, and the child care provider issue is covered by both of these laws and potentially gives employees up to 12 weeks of paid leave time. A little confusing, but that's where those two laws intersect. Emily, let's keep moving forward. There's phase three. This is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. This is the most recent act that was or issued by Congress, and this was, uh, became law on March 27th. So it's the most recent phase. It is the phase that people are working through now. And because of what has happened with phase three to date, I fully expect there to be a phase four. And I'm only using the terms phase one, two, and three because that's what the federal government is using. And I want you to understand what those are. So the portions of phase three, the CARES Act, as we'll call it, that applies directly to employers start in division A. Now, these laws are all set up with divisions, which are all individual acts. Uh, but here under the CARES Act, what everybody is really paying attention to right now falls under Division A, Title I, which is Title Keeping American Workers Paid and Employed Act. But you won't hear that. You'll hear about Section 1102 under Title I of the CARES Act, which is called the Paycheck Protect. Paycheck Protection Program. And that is right now the hot button issue. And I'm sure there are many of you in the audience that are waiting to hear back from your bank to see if your application was accepted. I know that this is the hot button issue across the state for attorneys and clients. Was my application for Paycheck Protection Program funds and reimbursement accepted? Well, I hope it was for your sake. Uh, for example, our firm has applied. We have not heard back yet, but as of yesterday, the Small Business Administration posted on their website that all of the allocated funds for this program are exhausted. There are no more funds. So those applicants who applied that weren't accepted before the exhaustion of the funds are left in limbo. And I think that limbo will probably be addressed by a phase four. But for right now, as things stand, we are all out of luck under the Paycheck Protection Program. So I'm gonna move on uh, to the other titles because that literally is at a standstill because it's currently unfunded for anybody other than has already been accepted into the program. I know that's not what you wanna hear. It's certainly not what I wanna tell you, but it is a fact that those funds are exhausted. So look for phase four. Now you can see on this particular slide, there are several other issues that are addressed that uh, go into the employment realm, but we're gonna move forward so that we can stop moving into the muddy maze and start working our way out of it with Amy's assistance. So Emily, if you would go to the next slide. And this is one that focuses on Title I of the, pay, the CARES Act, which is, generally known as the Paycheck Protection Program, although that's just the title for one of the sections under there. I'm not gonna go into details about this because right now they're irrelevant if you have not already been accepted for a loan. So Emily, let's move forward. Again, if you are accepted, you need to do certain things in the program and that, so those are laid out on this slide and the next slide, which we can go to. 
and everybody, I, I'm going fast through this so that we can get to the questions and answers. Uh, if you have been accepted into the PPP, uh, congratulations, you need to follow up with those provisions from the prior page. Uh, under the CARES Act Title II, uh, subtitle A there addresses unemployment insurance provisions. That is not going to directly affect you as an employer, but it will certainly impact many of your employees. And the big issue here is the federal government is going to kick in an extra $600 per week in benefits from the federal level for employees currently on unemployment compensation. And we believe that is going to run through July 31st, 2020. However, that could be extended. So that you can tell your employees will be their good news uh, should they be laid off or furloughed at, at, at this time. Again, this will not affect the employers directly, but it will certainly affect your employees who are furloughed or laid off, and them knowing this information may bring them some comfort during these difficult times. Emily, if we can jump forward. All right, now this page addresses the rebates which are coming out to employers and employees alike right now. I'm not gonna go into details. This page is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, you can get a rebate up to $1,200 per individual or $2,400 for joint filers, plus $500 in a tax credit for qualifying children. Uh, there are some limitations which are set forth in that third bullet, but let's keep moving forward as you can go back and review those materials at your leisure. Now, if you feel like you've stepped in and are stuck in a hard clay, wet, muddy mess, maze, you are. But fortunately, we have Amy here today. She's going to walk us through some of the questions that we have been receiving most frequently and help you answer some of those questions. So, Amy, welcome. And I'll let you run with the employment-related questions that we were getting. Thank you, Bill. Um, um, Welcome everybody, and, and we, now we've gotten to the point where if you feel like you've been through the whirlwind of all these new laws and regulations and orders, um, you are not alone if you have questions. So um, these are some of the top questions. I'm sure you'll have more, and please feel free to um, type those into the chat box, and Doug will be monitoring those for us, and we'll hopefully be able to address those at the end. Um, next slide, please, Emily. So the one of the first questions we get is, in light of this, the pandemic, what health-related questions am I allowed to ask my employee, employees to provide to me? Um, and the answer, because it is a pandemic, is, is kind of straightforward. If you show us the next slide, um, you can ask um, whether the employees are experiencing the known symptoms of COVID-19. Right now, we know those include fever, chills, shortness of breath, cough, sore throat. We're also hearing more about um, loss of uh, taste and smell. You can ask those questions. Um, certainly, if you observe things, just like um, in a normal work setting, if you observe employees who look or, or are acting like they're sick, um, you can ask them those questions. Um, next slide. The next question we get a lot is, um, beyond asking the questions, can I take employees' temperatures? We're hearing um, from a lot of our employer clients that they are taking temperatures. And if you show us the next slide, that is allowed. Um, but we also want you to make sure that you're looking for all of the other symptoms as well, because some people with COVID-19 do not experience a fever. The more you watch the news every day, it seems like we're learning that um, folks who are asymptomatic still ha are finding out they're positive for COVID-19 um, and are passing it along unknowingly. Um, so we, we wanna be on the lookout for all symptoms, but you can take temperatures. Um, now, normally you wouldn't be allowed to take temperatures because under the ADA, it's considered a medical examination, um, which is normally prohibited. But this is one of those limited circumstances in which um, 
uh, you are allowed to take the temperature. Um, it's, it's considered under that category of a direct threat because having somebody in the workplace who could be spreading something as contagious as COVID-19 is a direct threat to both themselves so they, they can go home and get rest and get, get well, but also certainly to your coworkers and anybody else that, that they interact with in the workplace. You have to make sure that you use factual information and be careful not to base decisions on irrational fears. That's language taken directly from the EEOC guidance. I've, we've, we've included as many uh, resources at the bottom or within the slides as possible. So you can go right to those links um, once you access the, the slideshow at the end of the uh, webinar. Um, also keep in mind, any records of temperatures are considered confidential medical records. So you need to keep them separate just as you would other medical records of your employees. Keep those in separate files, not in their regular personnel file. Okay, next slide please, Emily. Next question, can I send an employee home if they exhibit symptoms of COVID-19? And the answer is yes. Next slide, please. Um, if they're exhibiting symptoms, they can be sent home. And you should also tell them, make sure that they follow the CDC guidelines regarding monitoring their own symptoms. They can contact their healthcare provider. It sounds like most people are able to rest and, and do so at home. Um, but if they experience some of those really um, more extreme symptoms, they should be getting themselves to the doctor if they need to. Now, when it comes to returning to work, um, if you haven't already been on the CDC website, we've included those resources there. Um, a lot of people are not getting the COVID-19 tests um, and they're just able to um, rest and, and they're uh, considered um, a probable case of COVID-19 even without a test. So the CDC has provided a couple of different ways to um, allow those folks to come back to work after their symptoms have been um, gone. Um, those include um, um, not having a fever for 72 hours um, and other symptoms have improved like that cough they may have had or shortness of breath and at least seven days have passed since the symptoms have first appeared. That's the criteria for if they are not going to be tested. If they do receive a test and it's positive, um, then they can come back to work. Um, uh, if they no longer have a fever and if their other symptoms have improved and if they've received two negative tests in a row 24 hours apart. Um, I think most people will be in that first category. So um, access that CDC website and show your employees so you, you are kind of transparent with them about the rules that you need to follow and to keep everybody safe. The other thing I'd recommend is if you do decide to send an employee home, especially if they don't want to go home because they feel like they need to work or want to work, um, or if, if they do ask to go home, either way, I think it's always important in the moment or as soon as possible to, to document a few things. First of all, um, what symptoms did they have? Who was observing those symptoms, whether it was the, the employee who came to you or a coworker who, who noticed that somebody was coughing or, or some of the other symptoms? Um, what date the employee was sent home? So you have that hard fast date and to know how long it's been since they've been gone. And then you can check in with them periodically um, to see how they're doing, whether they're still experiencing symptoms to kind of check in with them. Okay, next slide. Um, we receive a lot of questions about are employees, employers required to allow employees to, re, to work remotely. Um, and on the one hand, this could be considered um, a request for an accommodation under the ADA. It has been before. Um, at this point, we also have the Ohio stay at home order. Um, and so non-essential businesses um, can still operate, may still operate, if they can do so remotely and safely. Um, but for essential businesses, um, you're still encouraged to allow employees to work remotely where possible. Um, and if not possible, if they have to be on site to perform their work, then um, 
you need to modify your workplace, make sure they're, everybody's staying six feet apart, provide that hand sanitizer, um, allow people time and, and space to wash hands, um, and then follow any of the CDC um, guidelines. OSHA also has a 25 page um, COVID-19 guideline booklet. Um, so you can go to all those um, resources as well about um, working remotely or if they're, you're working on site, what you need to do to keep the, the workplace safe. Okay, next slide. Okay, if an employee reports being diagnosed with COVID-19, may I alert the rest of the workplace? Um, the answer is yes, but with some limitations. Uh, you can and should notify your employees that a coworker has been diagnosed and of the, the other employee's potential exposure, but you should avoid using the name of the employee if at all possible. Um, you, can, you should provide information about when they worked, what shift they worked, where they worked within your facility, and what areas of the work um, facility that may be affected, where else they were. Um, and, and I think it's also a good idea because you're, you'll be doing it anyway. Tell them what your plan is for your, the cleaning the facility. Um, there's some good guidance on that from the OSHA um, website as well about what you need to do um, and the timeline of um, when you should access um, that space, whether you should open it up, whether you should keep it closed, and for how long. Next slide, please. So in addition to that, those kind of basic steps, if you know that some of the employees have been in direct contact with that person who was diagnosed with COVID-19, you can talk to them about whether they're experiencing any symptoms, you can take their temperature, um, and if, if you feel like um, they may have contracted it, you can ask them to self-quarantine. Um, they, again, should be advised to follow those CDC guidelines, monitor their own symptoms, maybe check in with their healthcare provider through telehealth if possible. Um, and at the bottom of the slide, you'll see some of the resources we're providing on that. Okay, the next question is um, probably one of the most common we've, that I've heard from employer clients, which is my employees heard about the $600, $600 extra a week they could get on unemployment and they'd rather, and they're scared, and they'd rather stay home and collect that unemployment. But we are an essential business, I have work for them, and what should I do about it? So I've been, you can go to the next slide please, Emily, sorry. I've been talking to clients a lot about, um, you, you, you may need to use this as an opportunity just to have a conversation with those employees. Um, talk to them about what you are doing to keep them safe in the workplace. There are CDC and OSHA guidelines, and, and in particular paragraph, I believe it's new paragraph 18 in the amended Ohio stay home order that tells you rules that you have to follow if you're an, an essential business employer and how to keep your workplace safe. Talk to them about what you're doing. I've had employer clients who say, I had an employee call, or I think an employee call the health department on us, and I talked to the health department. And if the employer says, yeah, I talked to the health department, I explained everything we're doing, and they said, that sounds great. I said, you could talk to your employees and tell them, we've even had the health department call, and they said that we're doing everything possibly um, to keep the, the workplace safe. Be transparent with your employees so that they understand that you're trying to keep things as safe as possible for them as well. Your employees may also have some creative solutions about how to operate um, in a safe environment, how to space things out. They, if they do that work, they may have some ideas and, and they may come up with an even better plan that we, than what you have. Next slide, please. So once you get past that first kind of hurdle, um, talk to them about why the stay home order may have uh, determined that you in particular are an essential. Well, it appears we lost Amy with her feed and it has frozen up. 
So I will, I will carry forward here with these questions. Really the idea here is to communicate with your employees and tell them why they need to come to work and what their risk is if they don't come to work. If you're an essential employer and they are not working and you have work for them, them leaving voluntarily is going to put their eligibility for unemployment at great risk. In fact, I would say it should be denied if those are the circumstances. So make sure that they know that it's not just a free gravy train if you have work for them and uh, you are an essential business. Or if you are a business that can have employees work remotely and they just don't want to, uh, explain to them that you know your request for unemployment is not necessarily an automatic grant of unemployment. So they do risk not getting the unemployment if they refuse to work. So Emily, let's move on to the next question. And this is, what should an employer do if an employee wants to wear a face mask in the workplace? Now, we'll move on to the next slide. And certainly you let them wear a face mask because that is arguably uh, a safety measure that helps not only the employee, but their coworkers. And I think it brings some comfort to employees. So until we're through this, crisis, certainly let your employees wear face masks or protective gear if they choose to do so. If you want a lot further guidance on that issue, you can go to the CDC website there at the bottom of this particular page. Let's move on, Amy or Emily. Looks like Amy is back. Hi, guys. I'm right. sorry about that. That's okay. We're up to question eight. I'll let you run from here. Did you say question eight? Eight, correct. Okay. Okay. So question eight is what documentation I need from employees who request the emergency paid sick leave or the expanded family medical leave? Go ahead to the next slide. Every employee, you should be requesting the name of the employee, the dates, both beginning and ending dates for which leave is requested, the reason for their leave, and um, get a statement from the employee that he or she is unable to work and why. Uh, next slide, please. For any employee requesting leave because, because he or she is subject to a quarantine or an isolation order or to care for an individual subject to those orders, um, get the name of the government entity um, that issued the order. In this case, um, the stay home order, we're not considering those in a quarantine or an isolation order, but you may have something more localized or um, that, that issued some sort of quarantine or isolation order for a small pocket. Um, and I would just get that printed off so you have your documentation. Uh, for those employees requesting leave to self quarantine based on the advice of a healthcare provider, uh, then get the name of the healthcare provider who gave that advice. Next slide, please. Hope you guys are hearing me now. Um, for all those employees who are requesting leave to care for their children whose school or place of uh, child care is closed, um, you'll want the name of the child being cared for. Uh, the ages don't hurt either. Uh, name of the school, place of care, or child care provider that's closed or become unavailable, and then a statement from the employee that no other suitable person is available to care for the child. Um, this is one of those opportunities that you can be a little creative. One of the, some of the guidelines within the, the Department of Labor um, questions and answers section talk a lot about um, you have an ability, if it works with your employer, to come up with a different schedule. If they can work from home for part of the day and then take care of their child or homeschool their child for the other part of the day, you can still get them to work a little bit and then they won't have to use all of the paid leave um, all up at once and in one big chunk. So if, if you can agree with, with your employee to do that, that's been one creative solution to kind of get through this period when we're all needing to stay at home as much as possible. Uh, number nine, I think, is where we are. Does Ohio Stay Home Order count as a qualified reason under number one in the Paid Sick Leave Act? This has come up with a couple of my clients recently. And I think the answer 
it technically is possibly, um, but in our case, we were dealing with essential workers, so I'll, I'll kind of uh, explain the differences between the two. The stay home order has to have caused the employee to be unable to work or telework. Um, so if, if you are still employed and your employer has work you could perform, um, but for the order, you could, you could still qualify for paid sick leave. Next slide. You'll, you'll remember that one of the reasons for leave under that EPSLA that, that Bill talked about was is the employee, the employee can be eligible for emergency paid leave if they're unable to work due, due to uh, being subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19. A lot of people, um, including me at first, picked up on that and thought, well, that's the Ohio State Home Order, so doesn't that mean everybody's eligible for paid sick leave? And that's, we've determined that that's not the case and the Department of Labor helped us out um, by answering some of those cues and cue questions and answers, um, in particular number 23 and tw 23 through 27. What threw us for the loop is their newest amendment to those. Number 60 includes stay home orders as um, one of the reasons that you could qualify under number one of the Paid Sick Leave Act. Um, but you have to think about for an essential worker. The Ohio Stay Home Order does not cause that essential worker to be unable to work because the Stay Home Order allows essential work. Um, so, um, in addition, if your employer has had to shut down because they're not an essential employer under the Stay Home Order, then uh, questions 23 through 27, especially 23 and 24, talk about in, in terms of a shutdown either before or after the effective. April 1st date of those acts. Um, if, if your employer is shut down, they don't have work for you and you need to file for unemployment. So that's kind of navigating um, the ins and outs of, of that really tricky question. Um, okay, next slide, I believe. Okay, a lot of um, employers are trying to figure out um, whether the FFCRA applies, um, it, it, especially if they have fewer than 50 employees. Next question, or next slide, please. It does apply to employers with fewer than 500 employees, um, including those who are usually not subject to the FMLA, um, but there is an exception. Um, it's possible that a lot of employers are gonna fall into this. Next slide. I've explained, kind of in detail um, how the Department of Labor has decided um, that those uh, employers with fewer than 50 employees are gonna have to sort of verify that <clears throat> permitting folks to, to have this paid leave is gonna um, have, a, have a drastic effect on, their, uh, effect on their business. And those are the three reasons that I won't read out loud for you. Okay. That's it. I think we are just at an hour and I apologize for losing the connection. Um, we're going to have everything available on the rcolaw.com website, including our resources and links page, which is highlighted there. All right. Thank you, Amy. Uh, we do have some questions that came in here on the Q&A. Uh, so we'll kind of do a lightning round here. I know we're up against an hour, but a, a lot of really good information and, and want to try and answer as many questions as we can before we get out of here. Uh, before we get into that, if you want to ask a question, you can do that a few different ways. Uh, there, If you scroll down to the bottom of your Zoom window, there's a chat button or a chat window. You can put it in the general chat. You can uh, do it in the Q&A. Uh, or if you're watching on Facebook, you can put that in just the Facebook comments. Uh, I'm watching like three screens here, so um, I'll, I'll get to those uh, as we get to them. But let's get to the ones that came in uh, as we're going through the presentation. Uh, Bill, Amy, Matt, feel free to chime in on this. Uh, when employees return to work, does the ADA allow employers to require doctor's notes certifying fitness for duty? <clears throat> I've seen this, I think this may be in the Department of Labor questions or maybe on the CDC website. 
um, the general sense of the answer to this question is um, you may not have a doctor available to provide a fitness for duty. So you need to be a little bit loose on, on um, your requirements. It may end up being an email or some, uh, un, you know, some, something that's not on your strict um, adherence to your form for a fitness for duty um, because uh, not everybody has that kind of access to their healthcare provider, but you you can uh, um, request that they've they've gone through those CDC steps and that um, if possible they've been able to reach their healthcare provider and their healthcare provider care provider can vouch for that in some fashion. All right, thank you, Amy. Uh, next question we received: uh, What liability might an employer have for failing to protect employees from exposures to COVID nineteen? failing to act quickly enough in that regard. I'll run with this one. There are two real major areas of exposure. One, I can anticipate uh, workers' compensation claims because an employee is temporarily incapacitated due to a virus. And if they can prove, and this is going to be the big issue, that that virus was contracted at the workplace, then that person is probably going to qualify for unemployment benefits. I'm sorry, for workers' compensation benefits. Uh, the mm -hmm. second scenario arises under OSHA. As an employer, you have a duty to provide employees with a safe workplace, and there may be a claim under OSHA or a complaint made to OSHA if your workplace is not safe. And that's why you want to take all of the precautions that Amy mentioned that are in some of the materials uh, to protect your employees and to keep us safe. The last thing you want is a visit from OSHA to do an on-site inspection. So keep a record of what you're doing, keep your place clean, and make sure that everybody is following uh, the guidelines. We'll get to the uh, next question in a second. I did have uh, Don chimed in on the chat that uh, I think this pertains to what we're talking about a little bit. Uh, that employers are permitted to decline to allow employees to use face masks and respirators with uh, when the PPE causes a hazard to the employee. Uh, that's been confirmed through dialogue with OSHA. I don't know if you guys have seen uh, anything more in that regard. I, I imagine in an industrial setting that there are probably some exceptions that would have to be made yeah, here. Ab absolutely. And yeah, everybody has to remember this is a very fluid situation and we are dealing with regulations those that we have to date, uh, one is called an interim final rule and one is called a temporary rule. So we are still in the very early throes of the legal aspects of the coronavirus. So yes, I would, I would absolutely agree with you, Doug. There are certain, cer certain circumstances where personal protective equipment may cause danger at the workplace and an employer can deny the use of it. All right, a couple more questions here. Uh, is there any guidance on decontamination for areas that infected employees may have accessed or specific cleaning requirements prior to allowing other employees to return to working in certain areas? Yes, the, the CDC has um, a, a several pages on their website that include what, how to clean, what materials to use to clean, um, and things like that. So if you go to those CDC links, usually I think most of them are in our document or I, and I know they're on our rcolaw.com website. All right, and I've got one more and we'll call it a day. Uh, this is a good hypothetical. Uh, so uh, one business has an employee who's working remotely in Wisconsin right now. Will they need to self quarantine before returning to their Ohio office? And if so, for how long? I think it would depend on whether the employee is showing any of these symptoms of the COVID-19 um, virus. If they are showing symptoms, I would have them quarantine for the safety of the employee and the fellow employees. Uh, if not, I think you go through the rigors that Amy talked about earlier uh, with regard to questioning about sore throat, cough, any of the other symptoms and taking the employee's temperature when they come back uh, to the main office or main location. And Emily, if you would uh, go to the next page, which is the final page, and just before we sign off, 
the link at the bottom of this page will take you to our website. There we have a COVID-19 list of items where you can link to directly from one spot a lot of the resources that we have talked about from the federal and state agencies. So we've tried to set it up so that you can do your own research or at least get some guidance from one spot. So use that link and uh, if you have questions, you're certainly welcome to get a hold of us. And thank you to the Finley Hancock County Chamber for hosting this and thank you to everybody who has attended. All right, well, Bill and, and Amy and, and Kathy, thank you for helping us set this up and, and Matt for getting us teed up today. Uh, I also want to thank Emily Young. She's been uh, running the, she's the backbone of all of our presentations that we do here. So good work by Emily as always. Uh, again, you'll be able to find this presentation at rcolaw.com. Uh, that'll be on their main page and their COVID page. We'll be uploading the, uh, the entirety of this webinar to our YouTube page at the Finley Hancock County Chamber here. Uh, that should be available a little bit later today as well. Uh, and like Bill said, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, thank you for spending your afternoon with us. It's a beautiful April uh, day, so go out and enjoy the beautiful weather that we're having right now. And uh, we will uh, we'll see you next week. We'll have some more Facebook Lives on our, our Findlay Hancock uh, cham Chamber page uh, and also some more YouTube videos coming along with information on how we can all get through this situation together. And again, have a great day.